أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحسي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم وآل بيته الطيبين الطاحرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن ما ملنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الحدى والفرقان صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم Lessons from the life of Nabi Musa alayhi salam from the Quran has been our ongoing topic and tonight is lecture number 9 uh, Previously on the lessons of Nabi Musa <laughs> He's now reached a stage in his life where he has become the prophet of God. And he left Madian with his family. On his way to Egypt, he had this encounter with God through the side of a mountain that was burning. A conversation ensued. Two miracles were shown. One of the staff, one of the, of, of the, of the, of the white hand. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then ends off by saying, I have prepared you, I have chosen you. And remember, before that now, he reminds Musa alayhi salam exactly what he has done for him so far. Not to throw it in his face, say, look what I've done for you. But saying all of that was to prepare you for this mission. Okay, so the difficulties you went through up until now was to prepare you for this moment. Now, Musa alayhi salam and his family are headed to Egypt. A homecoming. After how long? Ten years. Ten long years of being away from his people, away from his family, and yes, away from Fir'aun. A lot has changed in ten years. So on the outskirts of Egypt, when they begin to see the cities, the, 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 the buildings of Egypt now, Nabi Musa encounters a meeting of a group of people. Who are these people? These are the Israelites who would... Who would, who would oftentimes meet with their local scholar to discuss the awaited Savior and to prepare their, their, themselves for his arrival and to somehow figure out a way, to brainstorm a way that they can do what? They can hasten the reappearance or the appearance of the Savior. And this part of the story is so beautiful and so relevant to us. And this was a group that Musa had previously now met with, if you recall, in his time in Egypt. But now, he sees this group and he intentionally moves towards the group, now being who? The prophet of God. Now being the very savior that the people were waiting for. Now, in Bahar al-Anwar, Allah Majlisi rahmatullah alayhi, narrates this conversation between the priest and the people who are waiting for the savior. The way that it's described in the books, there weren't a lot of people, but they would gather frequently to talk about the Savior. How can we prepare ourselves for the arrival of the Savior? At that moment, the priest then has this beautiful conversation with his people. He says that, I just got an inspiration from, from our Lord, from our God, and he said that the Savior will be coming after 40 years, 40 years. And right away, all of them cheer and say, all praise is due to Allah, subhanAllah. Now keep in mind, these are people who have been on an hourly basis the subject to the oppression of Fir'aun. Torture upon torture at the highest level. 
sometimes for people like me, if I go through that one hour of or one more hour of that oppression is almost impossible for me to bear. Here, the priest is saying 40 more years of this oppression, then the Savior will come and save you. 40 more years. And to that, instead of complaining and saying, oh my God, he'll never come. Why take so long? What is this? They actually do what? They praise Allah. This response was so liked by Allah. Again, in Bahar now. So liked by Allah, the priest then says to them that because of your subhanAllah response, because the fact that you didn't complain and that you were actually happy about the fact that it's now in sight, we've reduced the 40 years to 30 years. 30 years. And they say, all goodness comes from Allah. Again, just not complaining, always being grateful. And again, the priest says, because of this response now, my, your God has reduced the 30 years now to 20 years. 20 years your Savior is coming. In 20 years, you'll be rescued from this Pharaoh. And again, they say, he is the one that dispels all falsehood. Allah is the one that dispels all the evil. He is, he is the one that relieves of our pain. Again, just praising God, praising God, praising God. He goes down to 10 years. They keep praising God. He then says to them very beautifully, very beautifully. He says that I've just been told, inspired by God, he's asked you to not leave this gathering. Your Savior has arrived. At that moment now, and I'm sorry, Hollywood can't write this stuff. Bollywood can't write this stuff. Musa now enters. The priest looks at Musa, says, what is your name? What do you want? Who are you? He says, Ana Musa ibn Imran. I am Musa, the son of Imran. I have come to you with a message from God for you and for Fir'aun. The priest grabs his hand, kisses his hand. They all celebrate. The Savior is here. The Savior is here. Musa sits with them for hours, Bahar says, hours, hours, preparing them, giving them, uh, uh, teaching them, giving them nasiyat and advice, and preparing them for the long journey ahead, saying, look, I've been sent here to, 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 to fight Musa, to be able now to do what? To stand up against Musa uh, with my brother Harun. You have to now stand with me. This is a long road ahead, a long journey ahead. You know, really, truly preparing the troops for this monumental battle against Fir'aun. We're gonna break, we're gonna bring down his palace. We're gonna relieve you all of your oppression. Can you imagine that moment? And why do I say, why is it so emotional for me right now, this story? Because it reminds me of us and Imam Zamana. Wallahi, it reminds me of us and Imam Zamana. If Allah was to tell you that in 50 years from now, the Imam will come, that's not going to happen. Let's say, for example, 50 years from now, the Imam will come, meaning 50 more years of hardships and oppression and injustice and difficulty and struggles and tribulations and trials and tests, 50 more years of this. How many of us would praise God? How many of us would sit there and complain to God? God, I've already gone through 20 years of this. You want me to go 50 more years? It's going to kill me. Right? Maybe if we just keep saying that one line in Dua Aha, they think it's near, we know it's Qareeb, we know it's near. They think it's far, we know it's near. They think it's far, we know it's near. And with every day that's passing, we know we're that much closer to our Savior, our Savior. And we continue to praise Allah. Even during a pandemic, we continue to praise Allah. Maybe, just maybe, because we are praising God in the hardships, He may send our Savior faster. He may send our Savior faster. And I pray to Allah, I beg to Allah, that we be that generation that witnesses the arrival of the Savior, just like the Bani Israel did, begging for Musa, begging for Musa, and he walks right into their meeting. It's so beautiful, guys. It's so beautiful. What, what more could we want? He spends the entire night with them, preparing them, teaching them, cleansing their soul, strengthening them, giving them courage, giving them energy. Say, look, we can do this. You got this. I'm right beside you, leading the way with my brother Harun. Morning arrives, and Musa heads home. His wife, his children now, and they go to his mom's house. 
Oh, the way that sometimes, I wish some of you knew Farsi, the way that sometimes, you know, the Farsi books, you know, describe the way that, you know, uh, the mother of Musa welcomed her son after 10 long years. 10 long years now. She's told that what? Musa has arrived. Musa has arrived. Musa has arrived. And the way the books say that she went running to the door to meet him. When she saw him, she clutched onto him. She grabbed him. She just, you know, some say, Bu'i dan wa bu'si dan. They, you know, she smelled his fragrance and she began to embrace him, began to kiss him, right? This was, this was Musa. This was the miracle son. This was the one that she, she gave birth to at a time where it was impossible to give birth to newborn, newborn boys. And then she put him in a river knowing full well that I know he'll be taken care of only to be reunited a few hours later. And then just like that, he was gone for 10 years. And now he's back with a wife and with children possibly. Can you imagine that reunion? You know, sometimes, I don't mean to make it into my own personal thing, I'm sorry. But you know, in, I remember my time in Qom in Iran, I would come back after 10 months, right? We leave in September, we come back in June. And you know, leading up to my flights, you know, my mother would call me almost on a daily basis. Haan, bita teen more dene, haan, bita do more dene, haan, bita kal mulaqat hogi, three more days, two more days, I'll see you tomorrow, inshallah. And then when I arrive, the door opens, she's there and she just, I only, that's 10 months, imagine 10 years. Beautiful moment. And then he sits down with, with Harun, says, look, this is what happened to me on my way to Egypt. We've been chosen now for this mission. I asked Allah now to make you make you my backbone and my and, and, and my support and he agreed. Now what Musa didn't realize, or maybe he did realize, is that Harun was already informed by God through inspiration that this is the mission that's going to happen. I'm going to reunite you and Musa and together you're going to topple the Pharaoh of your time. So Harun was ready. And all night it appeared, they were preparing, preparing, preparing what to do, what to do, what to do. And they would turn towards God. God, there's an element of fear inside of us. We don't know what to do. How do we approach this? And we'll go through the verses a, 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 little, a little bit later on. But at that moment now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now gives them an entire game plan. Go to him and tell him to free the Bani Israel from the clutches of oppression. Free them. When you go to him, however, speak to him in a very soft tone. This is where that very famous command, I've spoken about this command in, I know in Beit Al-Qaim's members several times, but I want to speak about it again here. This is where Allah says, when you go to Fir'aun, go to him with a very soft tone. You never know that maybe through your soft tone, he might have a little bit of softness inside of his heart towards me, towards God. Because eventually now Musa's, Musa's uh, uh, offer to Fir'aun is, look, you can keep your palace, you can keep your riches, just free the people of the Bani Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might be able to bardash and, and tahammul and, and, and be patient uh, you know, uh, with the fact that you have this love for the dunya. That's between you and your amal. It doesn't mean that you oppress people. That oppression is something that Allah cannot bear and cannot accept. But again, Allah says now, you are to go to him, Musa, but what? Qawlan layyana. If you remember, now I've already talked about the four different modes of communication on the member of Bayt Al-Qaim. Qawlan karima, qawlan sadida, qawlan layyana, qawlan baligha. That's all, inshallah, very fresh in your mind from several years ago, inshallah. It's fresh in my mind, at least. But this is the moment where he's telling you and Harun. And again, they say, look, we're scared. What if he oppresses us? What if he jails? What if something happens? And then that's when Allah says, فَلَا تَخَافَ وَإِنَّنِي مَعَكُمَا Don't be afraid. I'm with both of you. You go, I have your back. I'm with you. That... That moment that I read in the Quran, me personally, it just sends chills. Like God's telling Musa, what are you afraid of? I'm right beside you. I'm there with you. I'm there with you. you know, and, and sometimes it's a reminder for me and maybe for all of you uh, sitting at home right now that God is with you. When you're about to enter a very uncomfortable situation, when you're about to topple, let's say, either the oppressor outside of you or the oppressor inside of you, don't forget that God's with you in the process. You know, tonight at 10 o'clock, we have a, a live session 
with, with me, right? I mean, what, what, what better evening than, than, you know, twice with Asad Bhai. Oh my God, this is, you know, Eid Jaldi Aage Shad, right? And in that, we'll talk about fear of change. What is it that, that makes us so scared to change our life, to put that hijab on, to stop listening to music, right? To stop going to these mixed gatherings. Why is it so, what am I so afraid of? Do I need to be reminded that that same fear sometimes was inside Musa and Harun that look, we're gonna enter this palace, he has everything. What if we're not successful? And God says, just go, don't be afraid. Innani ma'akuma, I, I am with you. Does not say in that, he says in me. And all of you should know, it's a very beautiful discussion in the Quran, the various times Allah uses pronouns. Sometimes Allah refers to them as we in the Quran. We have revealed the Quran on the night of Qadr, for example. Sometimes he refers to himself as he. Allah is the one that what? He is the one. Say that Allahu wallahu ahad. Say that he is ahad. And sometimes he refers to himself as me in the first person as I. And there's been so much discussion on when and where and how does he use it. We know that when Allah uses the I pronoun, that I am with you, I answer your call, call upon me, it's a very beautiful, loving tone that he uses for his very special, special servants. This is that moment where he says, Innani ma'akuma, go, go, I'm with you guys. I see and hear everything. We'll go through the verses in a moment. I see and hear everything. Don't be afraid. Go. And now him and Harun now get together. They have the plan. They have God's blessing. They have God's power behind them. Right? They have this yaqeen. They have this certainty. And they make their way towards the palace of Fir'aun. Oh, that conversation. That reunion between these two individuals now, you know, uh, it, it, it said that, you know, he enters now, Musa enters the palace of Fir'aun, and they purposely wore very simple clothing, very simple clothing, enters this grand parada, a, a palace, pillars that look, look like it's up to the sky, right, gold this and diamonds that and just elaborate palaces, and in walk two members of the Bani Israel tribe dressed in the most modest of clothing, about to now topple the man who owns all of this. And, he, and they enter the room, on one side is Fir'aun, on one side is Musa, 10 years in the making, this clash is about to happen, they're about to have this intense conversation, to the point where about two minutes in, Fir'aun looks to him and says, whoa, wait a second, is that you Musa? And he says, yes it is. At that moment now, they have this heated conversation. And that's where I'll leave tonight's episode. To see exactly what this conversation is like. Tomorrow's speech will cover those that, that conversation, that heavy, monumental conversation between Fir'aun and Musa, 10 years after he left that city. Now let's come to the verses, inshallah. Okay? Surah Taha, verses 42 and 48 is what I want to go through with all of you today. Okay? So, this is now where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because a lot of what I read for you in the beginning of the speech was all from uh, Alama Madasis Bahar Anwar. Okay? That meeting with the uh, individuals who were waiting for the Savior, that's in Bahar. His homecoming is in Bahar. But this conversation he has with Harun Nabi Musa and both of them with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very much related and, and narrated inside the Quran. Okay? Uh, verse number 42 of Surah Taha. Surah Taha is the 20th chapter of the Quran. 20th chapter, verses 42 all the way down to 48. Okay, inshallah, again, like I say, every single night, open up your Qurans or you use up your apps, whatever the case may be, all of you together, the family, the kids, the pets, all of them, and let's go through verse by verse by verse. The first verse from 42 is this is where Allah now says to uh, Nabi Musa that you go, you go, anta wa ahuka, you and your brother go, right, and do not be negligent in remembering me, meaning don't lose sight of me throughout all this, you're bound to face difficulty, you're bound to face tense moments, 
But remember, as long as you have the vicar of me at that moment, I'll be there right beside you. Okay? And he's telling us, indirectly us right now, that even during the hardships and difficult moments, we also have to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Number 43 says, Go. Idhaba ila fir'aun innahu tagha. Now he says, both of you go, right? It's not idhib, it's idhaba. Both of you go now towards who? Towards fir'aun. He's transgressed. He's, he's, he's gone off the path. He needs a reminder. Tell him exactly who I am. But now when you speak to him, verse number 44 now, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا Speak to him with a soft tone. Now I've made this point before on the Beit Al-Qan member. I want to make it here as well. As a reminder, look at the remainder of the verse. Verse number 44 of Surah Taha. لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرُ أَوْ يَخْشَى Beautiful, beautiful. Spelling out exactly why is it that Allah is asking Musa, his chosen prophet, to speak to Fir'aun, his open enemy, with a soft tone. It's such a beautiful lesson for you and I, especially based on our session last night. We have our live session on anger. And so that session is fresh in your mind. Right? The power of a soft tone. The, the, you know, uh, Dafsir has done discussion on this verse. Why the hukum from Allah? for a soft tone to, towards Fir'aun. And it's important, remember, the, 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 the series is lessons from Nabi Musa's life, right? I'm not just up here telling the story, I wanna make sure we extract lessons in the month of Ramadan to apply to ourselves. This is, these are two beautiful points from this one verse of Surah, uh, Surah Taha, verse number 44. The first one is that this is the Prophet of God speaking. The Prophet of God should never find himself at the mercy of someone else's akhlaq. Okay, what I mean by that is that you look at the Prophet's Sira, you look at the Imam's uh, Akhlaq, you look at the Prophets before that. It seems as if one of the common trends that happens across all of their lives is that they never allowed the Akhlaq of the person in front of them to dictate their own Akhlaq. Meaning, if the person in front of them was Jahil, they became Jahil. Na'udhu Billah, no. If the person in front of them spewed fire at them, they would spew fire back. No, of course not. If the person was all, you know, Miti Miti Zaban, beautiful, talking nicely, they would also talk nicely. No, not like that. They had their own set of morals, their own values, their own Akhlaq, and regardless Regardless of what the akhlaq was in front of them, they would not move from their akhlaq. One reason why the hukum is coming down to Nabi Musa, qawlan layyina, speak to them with a soft tone, because you are a prophet of God. I've chosen you. I've prepared you from the moment that you were born. For 40 years I prepared you with hardship, with struggle, with moments of reflection, with moments of forgiveness, with 10 years with another prophet, all for this moment. Don't throw it all away with one releasing of the control of your tongue. Yes, seeing Fir'aun must make you angry. You saw things in your childhood that we couldn't see. You witnessed firsthand the oppression he had. You being a man of God, it must have been so difficult for you to keep your mouth quiet. Now that you have the backing of God, you have the miracle staff, the miracle hand, your brother beside you, it's bound to be that you just want to let Fir'aun have it. Rip a hole in him. But God says you're better than that. God says you maintain your beauty and your purity. And part of that is to always maintain the control of your tongue. Tone is everything, as all of you know. It's not sometimes even what is said, it's sometimes how it's said. This is the first point that we want to gather from this beautiful akhlaqi verse, is that we should never allow the person in front of me to, to cause me to lose control of my tongue. Otherwise, Fir'aun and Musa become at the exact same level. It becomes a shouting match between the enemy of God and the prophet of God. If someone was to walk into that room, they couldn't tell who is the prophet of God, who is the enemy of God. They're all, they both have the exact same akhlaq. That's point number one. Never allow anyone to have that control over you where you will lose control of your tongue because of their actions. Let their actions be judged by Allah for them. Don't allow their words, their tone to come and affect you. If you claim to be someone who has better tarbiyat and better uh, uh, upbringing and access now and fighting your nafs inside of you, then you show it sometimes at certain moments. One moment is when you are right across from a person who brings out their most, uh, the, the worst in you, who's an enemy of God or the enemy of you, for example. At that moment to show control of your tongue, oh, 
It's so important. Let me remind you of a hadith by Amid al-Mu'mineen. He says this lisan, this tongue of ours, this zaban inside of our mouth, right? He says, jirmuhu sagiru, jurmuhu thaqilu. Its jirm is small. Its, sa- its mass is small. How big is a tongue? Its jurm, its crime is very heavy. Jirm is sagir, jurm is thaqil. Very heavy. We can cause a lot of damage with this tongue. We talked about that last night in our live session. That's point number one. Point number two is the second half of this beautiful verse. Maybe Allah says, maybe la'allahu yatadhakru o yaksha. Maybe fir'aun, fir'aun, fir'aun of all people. Maybe with your soft tone, he might have a little bit of khushu in his heart for me. A little bit of dhikr for me in his heart. Meaning in the kingdom of Allah, nobody is to the point of no return. Everyone has a moment, has an opportunity, should be given a path of guidance to come back to Allah. There's never a moment where you close the door on anybody, be it on your kids, on your spouse, on your sibling, on your in-laws, or on yourself. Always remember, inspiration, tawfiq can happen at any time. You never know. At the same time, if you're trying to get to the heart of somebody and motivate them and shape them and inspire them, sometimes the softest of tones, the most loving of tones, the most compassionate of tones might have the effect that you desire. Being harsh with them, being stern with them, being insulting with them, even though you think it's tough love, doesn't work, especially with our children. Our children, this generation that we live in right now, they react to love. They react to compassion. They don't react to chappal, or they don't react to threat, or they don't react to dhamkiya. No, they don't. Maybe our, 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 we did or our, or, or, or our parents' generation, but this generation right now is a generation that needs to be raised on love. And if we need any example of how to nurture something or someone that's given to us, Let's look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How has He nurtured us? Has He always thrown the hellfire in our face? No. Wherever, wherever there was a moment, He would remind us of His Rahman and His Rahim, His mercy and His forgiveness. On top of that, you know, as elders in the community, as people of, uh, as parents who have older kids, right? I've seen too many times, a lot of our parents say, oh, my kid is gone, he's gumrah, Mulana. He's, you know, there's no point. Don't waste your time on him. This verse is saying Fir'aun, at that stage in his life, set in his ways, a palace around him, dhulm upon dhulm, he's immune to the oppression. Still God says, maybe, la'allahu, maybe, la'allahu, maybe. Because of your naram lahja and your soft tone, Musa, he might come around. Don't forget your mission. Your mission is not to gain the palace. Your mission is not to control the finances of Egypt. No, not at all. That's why when he entered the palace, he entered the palace in the most simplest of clothing. To remind Fidon, I don't want your seat. I don't want your kursi. I don't want your sultanat. I want you to stop oppressing the Israelites. I want you to stop being the oppressor. And understand that you are accountable to your Lord. This is one of those beautiful verses that the the Mufassirin, at least the two or three I saw today, really spent some time on. We can extract so much of that. This is now a prophet of God speaking to Fir'aun. You're a parent, you're a spouse, you're a, 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 a sibling, you're a child speaking to another believer, be it your husband or your wife or your child or your mother or your father or a community member who believe in God. They're not Fir'aun, are they? Well, Milana, sometimes, gabi gabi, every Friday, no, no, they're not Fir'aun, right? At least at that moment now, if Allah's hukum for, for the Prophet of Allah towards Fir'aun is to have a naram laja, what would, what would it be for us to speak to a fellow believer in God? Let's think about these things, especially during a time where we are in seclusion and we are with each other 24-7. This might be a great time for us to truly look at how we speak. If your spouse has told you, look, you're a little bit rough in your tongue, you're harsh in your tone, and you're stuck on, well, you're being too sensitive, well, you should look at what's being said and not what the tone is. It's not that simple. Even Allah says, قَوْلًا layyana does not talk about what's being said. When you do speak to him, Use the tone properly. 
It's becoming, it's becoming of you to maintain that of the month and greatness of the Prophet. It's also maybe that tablighi aspect, that maybe through your akhlaq, he might see you as the Prophet of God and then remember God himself. I hope that's clear to all of you. The next verse, okay? I'm down to one more minute left. The next verse says, this is where he says, قَالَ لَا تَخَافَ إِنَّنِي مَعَكُمَ أَسْمَعُ وَأَرَى Go, don't be afraid. I am with you both. I'm right beside you both. I hear and see everything. And then he says, when you go, tell him. Speak to him. Allah is now telling Musa and Harun exactly what to say. Surely we are two messengers of your Lord. So when you so so go you both to him and say, look at the way Allah is now wording it. It says, فَأَرْسَلَ مَعَنَا uh, Sorry, before that. إِنَّ رَسُولَ رَبِّكَ Allah is telling Musa, tell him that we are two messengers of your Lord. Look at the Arabic now. It says, Rabbika, not Rabbina. Does not say that we are the two messengers of our Lord. No. Reminding him, look, that Lord that you continue to neglect and deny and deny and neglect is already inside of you. You're not your Lord. You worship some you should be worshiping something else outside of you. To look at the way Allah says, remind him that I am also his Lord as well. Beautiful tablighi point. Right? Therefore, send the children of Israel with us and do not torment them. Indeed, we have brought to you a communication from your Lord and peace is on him who follows the guidance. And the last one is, surely it has been revealed to us that the, that the punishment will surely come upon him who rejects and turns back. Now they warn, right? And inshallah, when we narrate this intense talk between Musa and Fir'aun after 10 years tomorrow night, we'll talk about the fact that he actually delivers this message as Allah asked him to, and the response of Fir'aun uh, to Musa. And the back and forth is brilliant. And that of course happens when? Yeah, you guessed it, tomorrow night, inshallah. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to accept our qaleel efforts, to understand your words, apply your words, inshallah. We ask you, Allah, accept our amal, forgive our sins, allow our beautiful families to stand beside the Imam when he comes. Let us beg for our Savior, like the Bani Israel begged for their Savior, inshallah. Grant us our Savior soon, just like you granted the Savior to the Bani Israel. We'll see you tomorrow night. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.